different cultures promote different ideas about what counts as really high level goods, as what a society should really strive for. Uganda people think a good society is one in which everybody has lots of opportunities to take part in relationships of hierarchical interdependence between patrons and clients, that that feels like a good and secure life there. The Yeratman people in Papua New Guinea define the good life as one where, in which people have as many relationships with other people as they can, where both sides treat each other as equals. Euro-Americans, Western culture, roughly speaking, tend to value a world in which individuals are free to become who they choose to be, unencumbered by personal, economic, or political relationships that would prevent them from exercising this freedom. But these are just three examples. I could have given you other examples of different versions of the good, but I really just want to establish that if you look across cultures, you can see that people are defining the good in different ways. What should these differences mean for our moral lives? What should these kind of differences mean for the lives of people who do learn about them? Or why should you want to learn about them? What's in it for your own moral life? For a good part of the 20th century, people would link this kind of knowledge of cultural differences to their own moral, moral um, lives by taking the position of relativism. Okay? They would say that a good person is one who recognizes that ideas and ways of behaving and notions of morality are different across cultures, and a good person is one who trains themselves to understand these differences and therefore makes themselves tolerant of them. A good person is the kind of person who could look at the Zande saying that the granary collapsed on the person underneath it because the person underneath it had been attacked by a witch and could realize that that's a perfectly reasonable way of thinking in Zande in the Zande world and that it, it, can le it can give you a way of managing death that's very productive in that world and therefore you can be tolerant of those different ideas. That was this notion of relativism that you learned about other cultures so you could make yourself a more tolerable person. Okay? Of course, as I also mentioned, relativism wasn't just about saying other people's ideas make sense in their own terms. It also said similar things about their moral understandings. It said you can't judge other people's moral understandings and judgments on the terms of your own culture's moral ideas, right? So for instance, let's take a society in which marriages link families and families are the key building blocks of the political world and therefore marriages are major political events. In societies that are like that, and there are many of them around the world, marriages tend to be arranged by adults, not by the younger people getting married. And that's thought to be morally appropriate. Indeed, it's thought to be morally wrong and selfish for young people to marry on the basis of their own feelings. It's as if marriage is so important to the political structure, it has to be managed by the parental generation, that's morally right. It would be immoral for people just to act on their own feelings, which can be passing, after all, as we know, by the divorce rate, okay? The argument from a relativist would argue that only when you judge arranged marriages from the point of view of a culture that puts individuals and their free choices first, the only if you judge arranged marriages from the point of view of a culture where the highest good is individuals getting to make their own choices, for themselves, would you judge arranged marriages in that other culture as morally bad? In fact, you might call them, as they're often called in England, forced marriages, right? A relativist would say, morally, you shouldn't do that. You are judging them from the point of view of your own cultural understandings. You should take the time to learn why they make sense for the people who do them, okay? On the basis of arguments like that, moral relativists promoted the idea that Tolerance was a key virtue. You might want to study anthropology. You might want to learn about other cultures so that you could become a more tolerant person. That would be a good moral project. That is a good moral project. Fewer and fewer people these days are attracted to this kind of full-blown relativism. There's been a kind of hardening of moral attitudes, at least at their edges, you know, at least when it comes to looking at people from other cultures. More and more these days, people, even educated people, even some anthropologists, want to be able to identify and condemn practices they think are evil, even if they have to make those judgments that a practice is bad across cultural boundaries. More and more people want to be able to morally judge people living in societies other than their own. They're not willing to make 
the relativist, well, there's a philosopher named Jan John Cook who said that one of the things about moral relativism was it forced you into a position of what he called moral recusal. I can't judge them, I recuse myself because it's not my culture. Fewer and fewer people are willing to accept the demand for moral recusal that comes with being a relativist. So the question I want to focus on answering in the rest of my talk today is this. Okay, Given that many people these days don't want to be relativists anymore, they want to be able to judge across cultures, they want to be able to say that some things are evil and should be stopped, even if it's across a cultural boundary, given that people don't want to be relativists, what work is left for knowledge of cultural differences to do in our own moral lives? Is there a way we can make use of moral differences, not just to become tolerant of everything, but to improve ourselves morally in some other way? So that's the question I want to answer. If we don't want to be relativists, for the sake of argument, a lot of people don't want to be, so let's say for the sake of argument, we don't want to just tolerate everything. What work can moral differences do for our own moral development? And I think that's good for anthropology, too, because I should say with the decline of relativism, anthropology has become a little less popular. So I, for what it's worth, I think it's a key project for anthropology now, too, to find new moral uses for cultural difference. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to do. Okay. In working to, okay, so what I want to argue is that, and I'm going to be abstract for a minute, but this will get concrete very quickly, is that even if a broad-based cultural relativism doesn't work for people anymore, it doesn't give moral difference a role to play in our lives anymore that people are attracted to. I still think that the study of the various ways cultures define the good can help us find a role for cross-cultural differences in our moral life. Okay? Even if we don't want to be full-blown relativists and say we're just going to tolerate anything that makes sense to other people, I think that studying the ways people define the good still can help us develop our own moral understanding. And in, in working to substantiate that point, I'm going to suggest two different ways that a focus on different notions of the good is not the same thing as relativism. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to convince you that looking at the kind of differences I looked at in the first half between different versions of the good isn't quite the same thing as what relativists used to be up to. And that it's for this reason, I think, that focusing on differences in, in definitions of the good across cultures can help us think about how cultural differences can matter for our own lives. So first, I want to note a crucial way in which a focus on cultural understandings of the goods leads us to dwell on very different kinds of differences than the relativists dealt with. That's my first point. We could call that an empirical point. I'm going to say that the differences that we focus on, the differences that are out there in the world that we choose to focus on, are going to be different if we see ourselves as doing a comparative study of the good across cultures as opposed to doing a relativist study just of cultural difference in general. So that's the first point. We're going to look at different things. But then I also want to draw on a philosophical position known as value pluralism to suggest why a focus on the good can, can allow for a different use of data on moral difference than relativism did. So first I want to talk about the, the kinds of differences in the world we're going to attend to if we focus on different definitions of the good. Then I'm going to make a philosophical argument and conclusion about why focusing on differences in the good is a different project than trying to become a tolerant relativist. Um, so first on to my point about the fact that the cross-cultural study of differences in the good is a little different than relativists. If you think about it, and probably some of you have done this yourself, when, when anthropologists or philosophers or people in their own everyday conversations want to make relativist arguments, what do they focus on in other cultures? Well, they tend to focus on things they find morally upsetting. They tend to focus on things they find pretty repugnant. When you're about to have a, you know somebody's going to make a relativist argument when they say to you something like, well, I bet you think arranged marriage is bad. Or I bet you think ritual genital modification is bad. Or I bet you think infanticide is bad. Or there's a wonderful anthropological article a few years ago that actually started with the sentence, I bet you think child labor is bad. I knew I was in for a good article uh, <laughs> when she started with. But relatives always want to start you with something that you find morally repugnant, with something you basically find, as it were, disgusting, and then their technique is to tell you enough about the culture it comes from 
that maybe you could appreciate why it makes moral sense in its own local cultural terms. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.